Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Amritha Ramanan, and I'm the director of uh, literary management and dramaturgy at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And I'm so excited and so thrilled to be here this afternoon. Um, I first of all wanted to share that um, uh, we all, and many of you I know, came from Mojada and are still in many ways just emotionally processing that performance. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the amazing Luis Alfaro for the beautiful work that you've done. Oh, congratulations. Congratulations, yes, yes. Um, so with this discussion, soy yo, when geography, identity, and artistry collide, uh, when talking about, you know, the vision for, um, you know, the Latinx Playwright Project this year, uh, with Christopher Sibo, Leeds Salfaro, and Stephanie Castro, we were talking so much about, you know, this, uh, this really interesting concept of a global Latin identity and what it means to really harmonize um, where we come from, where we travel to, a sense of migration with, um, you know, personal artistry and identity and how that really fuels um, the work. And uh, I am so grateful to say that, you know, with this amazing group over here, um, so much of that is just so resonant in all of the work that you do that we'll get to explore more. And as Hector actually said uh, yesterday during our dinner, there's literally one degree of separation <laughs> within this group, um, but also an expanse in terms of geography, work in community, and um, work in terms of scholarship, writing, theater, um, you know, it just, it goes through the gamut. So, um, so we only have an hour and a half, so we'll see how far we go today, um, but I did at least want to start by saying um, we're going to have an introduction and then I have some questions and then we will open it up to all of you for any questions that you have and then we also have our friends at HowlRound TV um, live streaming this and so we will also take some questions from our virtual audience as well. So um, so I'm going to turn it over first to Hector to please, um, you know, to start with an introduction and I asked um, everyone here to, in their introduction, talk a little bit about what they are currently passionate about and working on so feel free to take it from there um, hello everybody um, I want to say thank you to OSF for inviting me and the rest of the panel um, uh, we've been coming here my family and I uh, as theater goers uh, for about 10 years it's been our family vacation um, I'm now part of a theater family because my son who saw Othello here at 10 and had that incredible production uh, wake up his artistic soul is going to start college uh, in the fall at NYU, Tisch studying theater. Mm. Um, thanks to uh, OSF, uh, thank you uh, for the art that you all give and you create and you spark in so many people. So I am Hector Tobar, I am the son of Guatemalan immigrants, uh, born and raised in Los Angeles. I, um, I began my writing career as a journalist. I wrote for the LA Times for 20 years. One of my uh, favorite stories was that I wrote about Luis Alfaro when he won the MacArthur Genius Grant. Yeah. Uh, I got to interview him for that. Um, later, I got an MFA in creative writing and became a novelist. I have now written two novels and two works of narrative nonfiction. Uh, my most recent book was about the Chilean miners. It was called Deep Down Dark, these guys who are trapped in the mine. And it later became a movie called The 33 starring, uh, starring Antonio Banderas. Mm -hmm. uh, and currently, I'm at work on a novel. Um, I also write for the New York Times sometimes and the New Yorker, but right now I work on a novel uh, that's about a Midwestern family that finds itself caught up in the war in El Salvador in the 1980s. Beautiful. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. That's Jose Luis. Yeah, there should be. Hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Jose Luis Valenzuela, and um, I'm from Mexico, and I'm a uh, Distinguished professor at UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I must say, uh, uh, the only reason I, I, I always say is 29 of us in UCLA out of 3,300 uh, professors. So it's, 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 I feel very honored to be one. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, I'm the artistic director of the Latino Theater Company and the Los Angeles Theater Center. Um, what I'm working on right now, I'm working on an Encuentro de las Americas, which is a theater festival. So we're bringing six companies, including 
carbon. Uh, six companies from Latin America, Latino companies from Latin America, and six Latino companies from the United States, and they'll spend three weeks uh, not only presenting their work to, to the audience, but also discussing why do we do what we do and how do we do it. Mm. which is very important. That, that's my real passion, how to change the narrative of Latino theater in the United States. And only through discussions like that, I think may be possible to move it forward. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Um, my name is Carmen Aguirre. I am based in Vancouver, Canada. I am uh, from Chile, from Santiago, Chile. I am the daughter of Chilean refugees who arrived in Canada in the 1970s. Uh, I've written and co-written 25 plays, um, and uh, I've written two memoirs. Okay, I'll brag, just like you did. Uh, th they're both n number one national bestsellers in Canada. Uh, one of them is called Something Fierce, and it's about my experience as a um, resistance worker in the 1980s when I was a teenager when I went back to Chile and joined the underground. Uh, the second one is called Mexican Hooker Number One, and it's about healing from post-traumatic stress disorder um, due to what I experienced in the resistance, but also to a very high profile rape that I was a victim of when I was 13 years old in Canada. Uh, very high profile because he was a serial child rapist. He was the most um, um, infamous uh, serial child rapist in Canada. Um, and currently I am working on a new book. This one will actually be a novel. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called Three Virgins. And uh, it takes place uh, during the 20th century in Chile. And it's all from the point of view of the right wing. Um, I am left wing in case you hadn't already <laughs> guessed <laughs> that. <laughs> I'm also working on a brand new play called Anywhere But Here, which actually takes place at the U.S.-Mexico border, and that's going to get produced soon, and I've got, uh, I know Shad, the word Shad means nothing to you, but Shad, who is the number one rapper in Canada, he's like Drake, he's doing, uh, <laughs> he's composing all the rap in my play, because there's a lot of rap in it. Um, and the play that I'm taking to the Encuentro is my newest one-woman show, which is called Broken Tailbone. And in that play, I teach the audience how to dance salsa for about 80 minutes while I weave uh, five stories uh, through the lesson. Um, the stories are the history of Latinx dance halls in Canada. The first Latinx dance hall ever in Canada was actually created by my parents at the Ukrainian Hall in Chinatown in Vancouver. <laughs> and um, geopolitical history of Latin America and then my own personal stories of the Latinx dance halls. So I'll leave it at that. Beautiful. Thank you. Oh, Thanks. you've got it. Well, thank you for having me as well. I'm Trevor Buffoni from New Orleans. Now I'm a Texan. I'm saying it, I'm claiming it, uh, in Houston. And I just want to say that I'm a little nervous to be following Mojada. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Luis. Mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I am a professor at the University of Houston. I teach Spanish and um, women's gender and sexuality studies. Uh, and my research primarily is on Latinx theater, uh, mostly Texas and California, specifically Boyle Heights and Los Angeles. Uh, so that's kind of how I entered this uh, place. But I also run the 50 Playwrights Project, which I'll talk about later. Uh, and I work with the Latinx Theater Commons, the co-champion of Cafe Onda, which is the online journal through HowlRound. So s you've all read something I've touched, you know, edited at some point. Mm. <laughs> and I've edited probably a third of the room, I feel like. And if I haven't, I will. <laughs> um, I feel like that's what I do. Did I miss something? Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much. I mean, it's uh, it's so incredible just in each of your introductions to hear about the richness and the intersectionality of your work, and I mean, just how it travels. And so, with that, I wanted to ask each of you, whoever wants to, you know, respond. Um, what you know, I I really always am so curious in terms of thinking about a starting point of inspiration and desire. And um, would really just on a very base level like to start with what inspires you to do what you do? And um, what are some of the, you know, the context in terms of geography or philosophy or something personal that has really just manifested in your work? 
What inspired me in my work, I, I actually, I actually do theater for political reasons. I always mm -hmm. thought as an activist, I, 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 when I came to the United States, I didn't know I was Mexican, and I figured out that Mexicans had a certain thing about who they supposed to be, which I was not. I was coming from Mexico City, and it made it my life and my mission to change that perspective. So inspires me and, and shakes me uh, to continue. I've been doing this for 40 years, and, and I feel like every day we experience something as the other mm -hmm. that I feel that mm -hmm. I need to talk about it mm -hmm. or expose it yeah. or have a conversation with you guys as an audience to about whatever is that moment that had happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, um, yes. Um, well, uh, what inspires me is um, I was raised in a socialist family, um, and I was uh, in being raised in a socialist family. I was taught from the time I was born that any skill set that you acquire, you have to put it at the, s at the service of the community. Mm -hmm. So when I started uh, theater school, and I learned that I was a person of color in theater school, and I was <laughs> taken aside <laughs> um, in my first few weeks at theater school by the faculty and told to quit because I would only ever get cast as a hooker and a maid. Um, that's when I decided that I would start writing the stories of the Chilean community in exile uh, because nobody else would, and also to create uh, work for myself. Um, so I've been doing that ever since, and um, I feel kind of like what you just said, that there is no end to it, that just when we think we're getting somewhere, um, something happens um, where we, are, we, we, we realize that the work has only just begun. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would sort of echo um, uh, what you've both said. Um, for me, writing is a sort of three, I'm um, the third generation in this three generation journey in which uh, writing has been a form of self defense, of expressing our humanity. Um, my uh, grandmother was a uh, mom, Guatemalan Mayan Indian, who never learned to read and write. And my father, uh, came to the United States when he was about 20, 21 years old with a fourth or fifth grade education and went to community college. And the first thing he bought me when my f sort of first really expensive gift was an American Heritage Dictionary of the English language. Mm -hmm. And so this man whose mother could not read a single word in any language gave his son all the words in English. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how I became a writer. I think that's why I became a writer even though I didn't know it was a profession. And as soon as I sort of came of age and realized that, yeah, writing was a political act, you know, uh, especially when you're a, a representative of a group that doesn't perceive itself or isn't perceived to have an intellectual life, mm -hmm. that if I was going to assert myself intellectually would have to be in response to empire, imperialism. And so for me, the sort of uh, really sort of dominant uh, truth of my early life as a writer was that I was from Los Angeles and Los Angeles was an imperial city, a city filled with refugees and working people uh, from the so-called uh, underdeveloped world, and, um, and that I was one of those citizens. I was a product of this uh, city of contradictions, mm. uh, the city that Luis is displayed uh, in, his, in his beautiful play, the emotional and political contradictions of living in that city made me into a writer and uh, made me want to create art. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say um, in terms of context, I have a few, I wrote some notes down, <laughs> the <laughs> scholar in me. Uh, but for me, uh, geography has played a really important part in my journey. I'm from New Orleans. Growing up, I very much was in a theater family, a theater going family. Uh, but I'm talking very, you know, Bye Bye Birdie, Oklahoma, and I love those shows. Uh, but that was my kind of, what I was exposed to for most of my life. I, my father's favorite movie is La Bamba. <laughs> I didn't quite realize what that was all about until, you know, 10 years ago. But, um, and now New Orleans actually has a Latino theater company, Arte Futuro Productions, uh, Jose Torres Tama. But when I was growing up, I wasn't exposed to really anything Latino. 
uh, in terms of theater, music, anything. Uh, and now looking back, I'm like, oh wow, like that existed. It just wasn't exposed to me. Um, so when I moved to Texas, I was able to really um, immerse myself in um, Latino theater. Um, there's a really vast network of people across the state doing really interesting things. And so that kind of opened my eyes. Uh, but another kind of um, context for me was Spanish language, right? So I began this journey, aside from theater, uh, through Spanish. I studied Spanish. I went to Latin America, Spain, studying abroad. Um, and I was interested in Latin American and Spanish theater. Mm -hmm. Nothing in the US, OK? Mm -hmm. um, and then I, you know, I started reading more playwrights and reading more plays. And I was working on um, Anna and the Tropics, mm -hmm. something on Anna and the Tropics by Nilo Cruz, but in Spanish. And I went and saw the play at Repertorio Español in New York. And that was my first ever, mm -hmm. you know, I saw it in the Heights. But mm -hmm. that was my first time ever going to a Latino theater company and having that experience, and um, it kind of woke me. Mm. Uh, I ended up reading all of his plays, and then I went through the canon, right? I read Luis's plays, and um, all of the things that were published, Che Moraga, uh, Luis Valdez. Mm. So um, Spanish really, I, and I still go back to that. I'm actually editing, co-editing an anthology of uh, plays in Spanish, mm -hmm. Latino plays in Spanish, which will be the first ever um, anthology that of just plays in Spanish, right? There's been bilingual ones, there's been, um, plays with you know, Spanish sprinkled in, but never just Spanish. So that's kind of an exciting thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. And then philosophically, I find um, a context that inspires me, uh, or that I always go back to, is giving voice to others, right? Using um, my positionality, my privileges, mm -hmm. to really, um, and understanding myself first so that I can help others. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of something I teach to my students, right? Understanding the internal before going to the external. Mm -hmm. um, and so because of these different positions at the university or in my community, um, or as an ally, just really uh, finding ways to uh, promote you know, Latino culture or Latino theater um, has really been kind of something that I always go back to. Uh, but what inspires me is the personal connections, right? So just knowing, uh, and we'll talk about 50 Playwrights Project later, but I have a personal connection with every one of those playwrights, and I promote their work in a unique way for each person. Mm -hmm. uh, so for instance, Luis Alfaro needs a different uh, promotion than, say, someone who has never had a production, right? Never had a reading. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm always looking for the ways I can push people's work, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in r communities that are going to be receptive to their work, right? Because not everyone's work is going to be recep received um, with open arms in every community. So I try to find the, the niches to really do that. Um, so I'll, I'll actually, I'll have one little thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, the way, my analogy is that I am playing, does anyone play The Sims or played The Sims back in the day, in the 90s, <laughs> early 2000s? <laughs> the Sims. So I think of myself as I'm playing a real life version of The Sims and the playwrights <laughs> are The Sims people, right? <laughs> um, and so I just pick them up and I put them here and then I introduce them to this person and that person. Um, and whenever they get a production or they get a reading or someone's um, writing about their play or whatever it might be, a retweet, that's, um, I guess, feeding the playwright. Mm -hmm. I need to work on my Sims analogy a little more. <laughs> uh, but that's kind of how I view it. So that really inspires me, right? And so there's a few that I really work very closely with. Um, and they very much they share their success with me in terms of you know texting me like hey like this just happened hmm. uh, what did you have to do with this and I'm like eh, you know uh, so that really inspires me this personal connection really having an investment in the actual person but people beautiful yeah. yes thank you thank you all for that um, Jose Luis I wanted to start with um, with a question for you and thinking of this um, uh, with you know echoing so much of what we've heard around um, you know. Uh, exposure, lifting up voices, highlighting, having a dialogue and conversation. I remain so inspired by everything that you've created with the Latino Theater Company and the journey that you've had with Latino Theater Company and LITC. And um, I was wondering, because I know there's some folks that are familiar with it, but if you could share more about the journey of the creation of Latino Theater Company and then what has been the experience in terms of you know, the decision of staying in LA and then also being part of LATC see now and what that means with the work that you do. Yeah. I'll do it really fast. I <laughs> <laughs> well, I, like I said, I started doing Chicano theater, mm -hmm. political theater, and then like in, in 1970, mm -hmm. 1971, and it was really important work for me uh, for until 
and then I met my wife, and we got married. I say, come to live with me in Santa Barbara, which I was part of Teatro de la Esperanza, uh, for a year, and she say, okay, a year, and then four years later, we still, then she says, okay, I'm leaving, you know, I'm going back to LA, either you come with me or you can stay, <laughs> so I moved to LA. <laughs> and interesting, because I never, I, in, 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 in our theater companies, we never audition, we never, you know, it's a company and ensemble. So I, I went to LA and I decided it's possible to do an ensemble company in a regional theater. Mm -hmm. And I started working at the Los Angeles Theater Center and I created an ensemble company called the Latino Theater Company now. And, but with the idea, can we go out into the community and do research about the issues and create plays about us and ensemble? Now they call it the vice theater, but it, we used to call it the collective creation in the 70s. And so, yeah, yeah. so we created this company at Los Angeles Theater Center, and we did nine plays on the main stage, mm -hmm. which was really important, meaning, and we, we brought culture class, we turned Latin synonymous, Luis performed on his, remember that was great, Luis. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it with your, uh, se llaman? Patines. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> the roller skates. Uh, and we did, you know, and we created many, many plays, uh, August 29, it, it was an idea of creating this Latino movement, and then in 91, that company declared bankruptcy, mm -hmm. so Gordon Davidson come to us and say, move to the Mark Taper as a company, mm -hmm. and we created uh, the Latino, <coughs> what was the name of it? The Tier Initiative, Latino Tier Initiative, which <laughs> Luis became a part of it too, and uh, we did, uh, Widows, Carpa Clash, Bandido, Florin Islands, <laughs> and that in the Maiden. You have to understand, we did five plays in two years at the Marte oh. Forum, which it was amazing during that time because oh, yeah. it was amazing. So it was always the idea. Huh? And then we left, and I became a professor, and, 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 and I love the LATC because the LATC gave the company the opportunity to, to really uh, produce and create yeah. for, for, for the five years. And we, you know, we did Jose Rivera, Eduardo Machado, I mean, we commissioned Sherry Moragas, Heroes and Saints. I mean, it was really kind of great time. Yeah. Uh, Octavio, we, we were, he was working in Santos and Santos. So it was a great time for us. And I felt like it was such an important place that when I came back, came back to, to the LATC. We came back to do a, a play called Dementia, and it was, uh, the city had been doing this <coughs> theater. He, they were managing the theater, and, and, the, and the theater was in an awful condition. So somebody told me, what do you think, why don't we take it over? Why don't you take it over mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and run this play? And it, it was really, as a Latino theater company, I thought we have done a lot mm -hmm. of what our mission was. And that place was give us the opportunity to bring all the communities together. Mm -hmm. By this mean, to be a real multicultural theater with real, you know, giving voice <laughs> to people in Los Angeles who usually don't get produced. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's been kind of a great journey. And the company is still together. I mean, uh, Lupe Antiveros died and, and Silva died. What, what, Trini Silva, who was a member of the company, died. But the five remain and we're still two. So we've been together for 30 years, the same actors. 30 years, oh my Th 30 God. 30 years. Wow. So Amazing. Yes. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. Awesome. And Luis, maybe we should bring that performance of yours back. I want to see that. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, uh, Carmen, I wanted to also ask you in this um, in this conversation around um, place and community and space. You spoke so beautifully about um, your journey from Chile to Canada and how so much of your personal experiences have become the manifestation of your work. Um, what has been your experience finding community in Canada through your work, and how much of um, how would you consider the cross cultural nature of your work in terms terms of how it is received in your community. Is that challenging? Is that embraced? What's, what's the feeling of that? 
Now, when you say my community, do you mean the theater Canadian theater community, or do you mean the Latino community in Canada? Oh, that's interesting. I was thinking theater community, but I'm actually curious about both. Oh, for what it's okay. Worth. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, in the theater community is quite challenging. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, Canadian Actors Equity Association, our actors union, did a census a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and for the first time in its history, asked uh, questions like, "What race do you identify as? Mm -hmm. What kind of roles do you get?" And the findings uh, for those of us who are of color were completely obvious, but for everybody else, it was shocking. Mm. Um, were that 3.7% uh, of the people that we see on Canadian professional stages mm -hmm. only three. 3.7% are women of color, mm. and of that 3.7%, almost none in lead roles. Um, and this is a major urban center is where more than 50% of the population is of non-European descent, like Vancouver, Toronto, etc. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, uh, I don't know, my, I mean, uh, my, my um, conclusion is that mainstream Canadian culture is a little bit more polite mm -hmm. than American mainstream Canadian, <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry, uh, American mainstream culture. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that people like me who speak up are considered kind of rude and, um, you know, uh, difficult, even, even though uh, my point of view has nothing to do with how I behave in a rehearsal hall, which is very professional. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been very hard. It's been very, very hard. I was telling uh, the cast um, and the director of um, the reading tomorrow of my play, The Refugee Hotel, that it was to receive its world premiere in 2004, so a long time ago, at the Factory Theatre in Toronto, which is a major theatre company in Canada, and that I pulled it um, a few months before uh, the world premiere because they had cast an all-white cast. Mm -hmm in a play which features uh, eight uh, Chilean characters. Um, and that uh, w was considered um, um, a very extreme move on my part, um, which uh, obviously it was. <laughs> but um, I was considered an extremist for even uh, doing that or even bringing that up. Um, and things have gone a little bit forward in Canada s since then, for sure, thanks to those of us of color who are willing to stand up and speak. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but we still have a lot of challenges, right? So for example, in Vancouver right now, we're fighting the fight because Vancouver Opera is about to do Othello with a white man playing Othello. And it's 2017. Um, so, you know, again, oh God, okay, now we have to have another town hall and another panel and another, okay, here we go again, right? And it, it gets quite exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, as for la the Latinx community, I mean, they're starving to have their stories uh, seen on stage. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I have received nothing but support from the Latinx community. Great. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all that. I remember when we were even talking yesterday about you pulling the production of Refugee Hotel, which you know we'll get to see the reading of. I I was just it's the courage that it takes to do that, but to be able to actually really stand by the integrity of the work. And so I really applaud you for that and honor you for that. So beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then also I wanted to ask, um, as you were sharing, you know, you, um, there's such, you know, amazing richness in terms of, you know, you have one woman shows that you perform and write, you have plays, you're working on novels. Um, was it, uh, or shall I say, was it a choice to actually want to go into each of those or was it more of a discovery in terms of how you would, you know, be an actor, be a writer, be a novelist and go through all of those disciplines as part of your work? Well, it really comes down to creating work for myself because of the numbers that I just gave, yeah. right? Um, yeah. It's still very, very difficult in Canada for a woman of color um, to get work, yeah. you know? And I'm a classically trained actor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, a lot of it just had to do with creating work for myself, but also in, in seeing that most of the stories that were being told on Canadian stages were about the individual crises of the white middle class. Yes. Um, uh, in, in again, in cities where more than 50% of the population is of non-European descent, yes. and where a large percentage of the population is not middle class, but poor. Mm -hmm. um, and those stories are still quite invisible on Canadian stages. So I really felt that, in, in terms of my skill set, that's what I wanted to do. 
to tell those stories. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, the power of body and voice and representation and what that means and its fullness. So beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, Hector, I also wanted to ask kind of in, in alignment with that, you know, I've been, um, I've been so moved by the combination of seeing um, the articles that you've written, the novels that you've written. Even today um, on New York's, you know, on New York Times, you have this incredible article about Southside LA, you know, after the, you know, 25 years after the Rodney King riots. And the work that you have also has such a global context in terms of voices from the communities. So with your work, how um, was there intentionality in terms of the places and spaces that you would travel to? Or did that become a discovery? And then what has been your experience in you know, the responsibility as a novelist and journalist to share and lift up voices from many different communities? Well, um, you know, when I started off as a writer, I was a professional listener. Mm -hmm. So I really couldn't, I didn't make up stories, I just told stories that other people told me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I went to places that other people in the newsroom didn't want to go to or were scared to go to. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went, you know, to a lot of homeless camps mm -hmm. in the center of LA. I went to um, South LA a lot, which mm -hmm. I really got to know really well. South LA then was becoming a Latino uh, and black mixed community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, you know, to me, that, that's how I got started as an artist was that I'd spend two hours interviewing a guy, a day laborer, mm -hmm. and I'd be able to put two or three paragraphs of his story into the newspaper. And I thought, well, I have so much more to say about this person as a human being, about his history, about the context in which he's living. Mm -hmm. Let me go get an MFA and I can write novels. Mm -hmm. which I lear later learned was like a license to go wait tables. <laughs> and thing, you know? um, but uh, and so I gave up my career as a journalist temporarily uh, for a couple of years, wrote my first novel. And I have just followed, I'm always looking for a story that does something subversive for me, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. something that turns upside down the perception of my community. Um, something that makes me feel powerful. Yeah. Um, I like to tell, I teach writing at the University of Oregon and I like to tell my students that when you, when you do narrative writing and you do it well, you are God. Hmm. And that has to be your ambition is to become God. You make, you burn cities and you make them rise from the ashes. Mm -hmm. You know, you get inside the head of the, of the single mother. You are everywhere, you're omniscient. And that's what you, what I try to do as a reporter first yeah. was to be this uh, person who is really selfless um, in, in the gathering information, you know, just of, of gathering stories. But then I write the story that has my name on it. Makes me feel, <laughs> makes me feel very special. And so then now, as a novelist, it's the same thing. It's like who else can I become? You know, I, mm. my last novel, I wrote a novel from the point of view of two women. Uh -huh. And you know, you're supposed to write what you know. I believe that you should know what you write. Mm. You know, mm. and that you can know anything. And so, um, it's been. I, I go to. You know, I was very fortunate after I had written my uh, second novel, my third book. Uh, this a gig came up to do the book of the Chilean miners, these guys who were trapped mm -hmm. um, in a mine in Chile. And I jumped at the chance. Um, they were looking for a novelist who had been a journalist, who was also someone who spoke Spanish and wrote in English and had lived in South America. And that's only me. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe Francisco Goldman, yes. <laughs> but I was represented by the William Morris Endeavor Agency, so I got the gig. Mm. And so I went down there and I talked to these guys and it was a room just like this one. is a restaurant with a little sort of stage. And there's 24 of the 33 miners and I told them, senores, you just lived you're the modern heroes of our age. You just lived through the odyssey of our time. You were buried in a hole and you had this journey to come up and escape and come out into the sunshine and you had to fight the monsters and everything. And so my job is to tell your story in a way that it will be remembered for hundreds of years. You are like Odysseus and I am your Homer. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of blank stares <laughs> from the guys. But you know, and so I think, I think there is this aspect too that I like to teach my students of just wanting to be a badass at writing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's part of it. You know, we represent our communities. Yes, we're here to stand for our communities, but we also want to be badasses as artists. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we want to, you know, s study our craft mm -hmm. and lift it up 
And um, it took me many, many years, decades of a journey to be able to even call myself an artist, mm -hmm. you know, sure. um, because in my very practical Guatemalan family, mm. that's putting on airs. Mm. And today, in fact, we have lots of kids who in our schools who have this desire, they feel this desire to create something, and yet they feel, oh no, my mother wants me to be a nurse or, you know, study engineering. And so part of my art job, I think, is just to be an example. Mm -hmm. You know, just to, uh, and the job of so many people here too is to be that example that shows um, the fullness, the life of an artist, um, the power of it. You know, the power to create and reflect back of the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Um, well, a couple things I wanted to say. I remember last night actually when we were at dinner, we discovered that one of the miners you interviewed is Carmen's uncle. So like that in itself was such a beautiful kind of moment of discovery and connection. Yeah. Um, and then to what you speak to, I mean, I do think there's uh, there's something so interesting about um, you know within our conversations the political context of the work and the value. Of social justice, but also what does the art really mean to and how do we, you know, in ourselves, actually as artists, um, we're part of a social movement in that way, right? Like there's such value in that, you know, and being the badass in the art that you do. Is well, I, yeah, the, yeah, the one thing I want to say about that is that I started off as a total lefty, you know, and I still am, you know, I mean, I was a teenage Trotskyist, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I left <laughs> the movement because I didn't want to give up my sense of humor and that mm. was required. <laughs> and so... Uh, <laughs> But then, you know, it's like I started to create art, and it was like I realized that it had to work as art, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that was another, because I don't have this emotional intelligence that most of the people in this room have. So I had to be married 20 years and have three kids to sort of finally have this emotional intelligence mm -hmm. to be able to be an artist. Mm -hmm. But yes, and you know, it's, it's been a really wonderful journey. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I was gonna say about that, because it's interesting, but because uh, <coughs> In order for, for, for me to even become a professor at UCLA, which yeah. is a complicated hire for UCLA to do, I actually have to direct in Europe a lot right. yeah, yeah. for people in the United States to even think of me as a director. Yeah. Wow. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. over there, I can direct anything than Shakespeare and Ibsen and Chekhov, you know? And it's no question because I don't I'm not have to deal with my identity, hmm. which is part of who I am in the United States. And I'm not embarrassed. I mean, I am a Latino director, mm -hmm. and I love to direct Latino work. Mm -hmm. But the real, m my real acceptance into the United States mainstream was my work in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Right. Which, which right. it's not about, you know, I just did Pierre Gint. In, in, in Norway, mm -hmm. in Norwegian, mm. with Norwegian actors, mm -hmm. and it was fantastic. You, you know what I mean? But it's one of the last one I did. But nobody would ask me to come and direct Pierre Gint in the United States. Mm. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't even cross their mind. Mm -hmm. You know, so which is, uh, meaning it's another battle. So yes. I, even that is a political statement mm -hmm. in a way. Mm. It, it seems like we have to travel far away from home to get validated. Yeah. Mm. That, that's, yeah. That, that's the, yes, true. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah. Oh, true. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I also, um, yes, definitely. And with that, too, I also wanted, um, Trevor, we were talking a little bit about, um, about the 50 Playwrights Project, um, which I wanted to give, you know, just a little bit more context and space for you to share about, um, especially because I was reading an interview of, of you where I, you had this brilliant quote where you talked about how um, your introduction to Latinx theater decolonized your mind and how with the 50 Playwrights Project there was very much this desire to create awareness and really celebrate voice. And so can you speak more to the creation of that project? For sure. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so 50 Playwrights Project is uh, mm -hmm. my passion project, but it's kind of taking over mm -hmm. my life in a very good way. Yeah. And I started this last year, early last year. But basically what happened was when I was doing my PhD, I frequently used Adam Simkowitz's website. He's a playwright who has interviewed, and I cannot keep up with him. As of today, I think it is 929 playwrights. Um, and some of them are in this room. Uh, but most, mostly I was noticing that um, after I got to Elaine Romero and Octavio Solis, Luis Alfaro, there was a very startling um, absence of diverse voices, right? And especially the voices I, was, I knew and I was interested in studying and reading their work. And so I wanted to create this kind of 
uh, steal like an artist, right? A uh, project that really used his model but created something that was more specific to a certain community, right? <coughs> I had no time. I was doing my PhD. I was talking to Olga Sanchez earlier about how when you do a PhD, you have zero time. And when you do theater, you have zero time as well. So uh, I finally, I finished my, my work and I um, had a chance meeting with a playwright, Josh Inocencio, who is a uh, emerging playwright from Houston. He moved back to Texas uh, after he finished his master's degree and so we met for coffee and he became my first Sims playwright. <laughs> and um, basically I, I baited him, right? I used him, um, well I didn't use him. What? I, I used him, right. Yeah. I bounced the idea <laughs> off of him, and he was also in a place in his life where he was kind of mm -hmm. ready to be baited. Uh, and so I kind of bounced the ideas off of him. He uh, was like, yeah, this is really great. I got a, in an uh, unofficial advisory board, uh, people in Lat Latinx theater commons, and friends of mine in Houston, um, such as like Abigail Vega and those types of people, and really um, crafted what, I, what this was going to become. And so I thought my original idea, 50 Playwrights Project, this will take me many years to do because I'm not gonna have that many interviews. It'll be hard to find people. People are not gonna wanna do it. I don't wanna be too ambitious. I like the number 50. Um, <laughs> it's my brother's, reasons, my brother's yes. football number, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, back in the day. And so that's kind of where it began. So I started this website, which you can all visit um, on your phones or at home. 50playwrights.org, 50playwrights.org, and we have Twitter, 50playwrights, Instagram, all of the social medias. <laughs> um, and this really kind of spiraled out of control in a very, very good way. And so as of today, I've interviewed 54 uh, Latinx playwrights. Now I'll, I'll go back. When this first started, um, I met many people, some very prominent, um, no one in theater, but Latinx writers, right? Nationally famous we've all read them, who immediately told me, there are not 50 playwrights. They're not 50 Latinx playwrights. Mm. Like, where are you gonna find these people? And I, I mean, it really, it took no time to make, I have this Google, uh, Google sheet with hundreds of names, right? And on the website, there's um, different resources you can see. If you go to resources, playwrights, and there's 350 or so, some have been deceased, but um, for the most part, still producing work at varying stages. So the numbers are undeniable, right? Uh, that these playwrights are out there doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, but I have, in the beginning, I had that resistance. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, it's been very, actually, easy for me to keep this going because of the support from the community, right? Um, in terms of online and in person, right? And I've seen the actual <coughs> connections happen where people are meeting uh, generationally and also in their own communities, right? Like, oh my gosh, there's another Latinx playwright in Oregon or in um, Portland, right? And they get together for coffee, all of a sudden they're trading drafts and community is building, right? And it's through the work that I'm doing online. Um, so if you go to the interviews, they're very much accessible, in, you know, introductory. I wanted it to be something that uh, professors would encourage their students to use, which it has happened. Uh, there are a number of professors who push it to their students. Uh, but it's very much who, are the, who is the person, where are they from, how do they self-identify? And that's actually become one of the most interesting uh, parts of the project, I find. And then what are they working on? Um, and also another thing that's interesting to me is the mentor part. Who have been your mentors? Mm -hmm. And so there's really this interesting um, thing happening where there's a, and I need to kind of create some kind of visual. If anyone does visuals, talk to me after this. <laughs> um, of really looking at the maps, right? We talk about uh, one of the kind of Mytho mythological or mytho uh, myths um, or actual stories from Latinx theater commons is that, I think Tiff Tiffany, you did it actually, where you had the visual mapping, right? Or maybe it was Juliet, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, Brian Herrera's book, A Narrative Report, will say what I'm trying to say better than me. <laughs> but um, it was Luis Valdez and then Magdalia Cruz was standing in for Irene Fornes, right? And everyone touched basically their mentor and they created this map of mentors mm -hmm. uh, in Latinx theater making. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to do in that section, right? Who, is, who are our connectors? Um, who has gotten us where we are? And where is that going? So that's been a really interesting thing. Um, some other things, I, it's very, my methodology is very much a feminist methodology. I'm not looking to be a gatekeeper. I'm looking to have 
um, as many voices, um, plurality of voices as I can. Um, having emerging writers next to established writers. So to me, it's kind of a treat when you have a Pulitzer Prize winner or like Karadat Svich, Obie, Obie Award, Lifetime Achievement Award, next to someone who has never had a single um, anything. They just graduated college, they're writing plays, mm -hmm. and they're next to each other, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so people come for, I think, the big names, and then they stay for the, the new writers, right, that they're learning about. Now I have had pushback. Um, one of the most prominent Latino theater scholars when I put out a, uh, the list of um, the 350 or so playwrights, we all know who I'm talking about, <laughs> he um, emailed me a very long email. How are you vetting these people, right? How, who says they're playwrights? Um, mm. Well, not, I mean, he's, he, we love him. Uh, <laughs> but who, you know, have they been reviewed? Have they been produced? Mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I wrote back a very long response, and he said, we'll talk about it when I see you in person. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I saw him in person, and he brought it up, and I just kind of, it was a generational divide, right? To me, it's not my job to say, oh, you have not been produced at the Goodman. You cannot be on this website. Mm -hmm. I want you to be produced at the Goodman, or wherever you want to be produced. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then using my resources to kind of help that, uh, guide that along. But um, for the most part, there's been very little criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just something interesting to me generationally. Um, and so I'm going to try to cut this a little short. Mm -hmm. um, so it started out as interviews. I recently, in March, dropped the 50 PP list, which is the um, best unproduced playlist. I had a call, a national or international call, for uh, unproduced Latinx plays. I had about 70 submissions, and I had a reading committee, and we picked eight plays that we thought were the strongest um, for a number of reasons, and then two honorable mentions. Uh, and this kind of blew up. And so I've had, these are the theater companies that have reached out who, these are, um, who wanted to read these plays um, that are not on, say, the New Play Exchange, where it's easily accessible, but American Repertory Theater, Berkeley Rep, Soul Project, Flea Theater, the Alley Theater, Company One, Baltimore Center Stage, OSF, uh, Next Generation Theater Company. Uh, there's a company in Boise, Idaho, that was looking to do deaf Latino plays, and they found one of the playwrights, Mercedes Flores Islas from UCR, um, and they are interested in her work, right, just from this list. So I think that's just what keeps me going. Um, I'm going to have another you know, call for plays later. I'm trying to do all kinds of different things. I'm working with the Dramatist Guild and New Play Exchange to grow the project. Um, I'm going to have a reading series in the fall or the next season, like an actual season. Um, and not just reading, but new play development reading with the playwright in the room um, with the director kind of hashing through the script. So that's kind of where it's all gone <laughs> and going. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to open it up to questions, and also um, during one of our phone calls, um, Jose Luis had the great suggestion that uh, perhaps um, if there's interest in um, questions from the panelists asking each other <laughs> something from this, that that's also part of it. So feel free if you have questions, and then we'll also start to roam around the audience as well for questions. And Tara, please keep us posted if there's anything coming up online that we can add. So any questions? Yeah. Thoughts? Uh, uh, yes, yeah. yeah. I'm interested in your, your list of playwrights and the rest of you also. Uh, what language are people using? Hector, I found you because I was looking, I belong to Spanish book club, but we were looking for writers and I saw your name and sounded Spanish. So I have run to be here. Oh, okay. So anyway, I'm just interested. I noticed that you write in English. You know, your your Latinx group. Do they write in English? Do they write in Spanish? How are they being produced? And when you have Spanish productions in this country, who is your audience? Well, I'll take that real quick. Um, in terms of Fifty Playwrights Project, I always give the playwright the option uh, to do it bilingually or just in Spanish. Uh, as of now, I think only two or three are bilingual. Um, but I would say, and w from what I've seen, there are a number of, when I did the call for the, I talked about the Spanish play anthology. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I did the call for the Spanish play anthology, and my co-editors were very nervous that there would not be any submissions. And we actually got about 40 submissions, um, and we can only fit about six, right? Uh, but the work is out there. It's very high quality work. I find um, online communities, I work with Cafe Onda too, and HowlRound TV, um, hashtag HowlRound. Uh, but we're always providing the option for Spanish, right? Um, my readership for my website is probably 
I would, I don't know, guesstimate 50% of them speak Spanish. Um, but it's just not what the playwrights have chosen for whatever reason to write in. I don't know. Well, um, I write in English, but it's, I would say it's 85% English and it's 10% Spanish and 5% Spanglish. And, you know, what I've discovered over the, uh, over the years, and I think probably we all have, is that I find the audience becoming more sophisticated about um, language mixing, you know, the so-called so code switching yep. that Chicano art was uh, sort of pioneered. Um, I really find that people will go with me if I have untranslated Spanish in my prose. Um, and so, you know, I, I think one of the, uh, you know, I did a, a book that was made into a movie called The 33, and I think one of the reasons why that movie didn't do so great, and I know that I'm being live streamed now, sorry, uh, guys over there, uh, is that um, they had this cast that was um, incredibly international. They had an Irish guy, a French woman, uh, one or two Chileans, uh, Filipino, Mexicano. Uh, they had uh, you know, sp a Spanish, Iberian Spanish person, and they were all playing Chileans. And they had this sort of melange of accents, and I know that to, a lot of sophisticated, you know, to us as sophisticated viewers, you know, it was like it just didn't make any sense, you know? And I really- I mean, I, were I, saying that we all, we weren't talking like that? Oh yeah, it was, a, it, was a me it was a mess. It was, yes. They did say we're on every once in a while, but mostly it no, was- No, It was a mixture of the Bronx and East LA and <laughs> Stockton and, Madrid and you know and uh, you know there was even Gabriel Byrne who's Irish you know doing a, a you know Chilean and so I you know the, I think that you know we I really have an incredible high respect for my readership that they'll go with me I I believe that they are interested in they are capable of understanding a lot of the subtleties of language and speech you know, in my last novel, I wanted, to, I wanted to do something like Mark Twain did at the beginning of Huckleberry Finn. I wanted to say, and I should have done this, and it's really one of the biggest regrets of my career, is that I didn't say, uh, the reader of this novel uh, should be aware that uh, the characters are speaking in Los Angeles, Chicano English, Central American Spanish, Mexican, Mexico City Spanish, and, you know, standard American English you know, and not think that I'm incapable of understanding all of those. I'm trying to master all of them. And so, um, you know, I really think uh, it's, it's, we have, in our heads, we have all these different languages, you know? Um, and so we like to just pull out, uh, you know, all these different sort of expressions and verbs and sayings. And we, of course, just saw this in Luis's play, uh, which is so beautiful, um, you know, even using indigenous words. And um, so, yeah, I, I write in many languages. Yeah, I'll add a quick story. I, um, earlier this semester, I uh, brought Josh Inocencio's solo show, Purple Eyes, to my campus. And the show is probably 85%, 90% English, 9% uh, Spanish, 1% German. But the German's there. And uh, after, so during the performance, everything went well. Uh, reaction was great. In class the next day, I had, my students could not get past the Spanish. Um, even the Spanish speakers had issues with the Spanish. Uh, and then after this conversation, I'm trying to navigate, and then someone says, hey, um, I haven't heard anyone complain about the German in the play. Um, I just noticed that everyone here is racializing Spanish and having an issue with Spanish, whereas they're not even noticing German. And across the board, uh, my students were like, what, there was German? <laughs> there was German in that play? I mean, there's an entire scene in German, right? Um, <laughs> right? Um, so th there's German, right? And then they, they question me like, oh, well, are you sure? And I'm like, I, I'm the dramaturg. I, I know how much Spanish was in the play. Uh, but there's this kind of mental hurdle, right? And then another one I used uh, this semester was Adelina Anthony's Las Osiconas, which has more Spanish. Uh, and I had a student email me and say, I could not do our homework assignment because I couldn't understand anything in this play because I don't speak Spanish. And so I got my memes, my Juno Diaz. Has anyone seen the meme? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I hope my parents are not watching. Uh, <laughs> motherfuckers will read a third of a novel in Elvish, but one word in Spanish, and you know, <laughs> and they're done. <laughs> right? Sorry, mom and dad. 
but that's kind of the, <laughs> it's true, right? And they laughed when I showed them, but it's something that I'm kind of constantly struggling with, and so I've, and I try not to give too much, um, I try not to prepare my students too much for what they're about to see. I want them to really have a raw experience, uh, but sometimes they need that, hey, you're gonna read Spanish, if you don't know what it says, Google it, skip it, I don't know, whatever you wanna do, but you're gonna keep reading, and you're gonna get it, right? Um, so, yeah. Well, I write, even though I write for the Latinx community and about the Latinx community, I write my plays almost 100% in English because uh, the Latinx community in Canada is only about 40 years, 40 years old. So the first Latinx people to arrive en masse were us, the Chilean refugees. Um, and, um, you know, the non-Latinx community gets very nervous when they hear a Spanish word in a play because they literally don't know what it means. Like, like you know, uh, they have no clue. And so it takes them out. So that's what I've learned. I want to keep them in, and it takes them out. There's one word in Spanish, and they lose the entire scene because they keep trying to figure out what that word means. Um, having said that, my plays have been uh, translated into Chilean Spanish mm -hmm. because I've done them in Chile. And also, uh, they've been done in Spanish in Toronto. Um, oh, no, and in Vancouver as well, right? So those are obviously a, almost, you know, 100% well, Spanish-speaking audiences. But I'm still at the point where if I, if I have too many Spanish words in a play, the audience gets taken out just because our presence in the, in the Canadian uh, tapestry is so new uh, that uh, Spanish words are not part of the mainstream yet. Yeah, unless it's una cerveza, por favor. <laughs> well, <I laughs> no, think seriously, yeah. That was something that was beautiful about Mojada was uh, the very beginning of the play was just in Spanish, right? And so I immediately started watching the audience, like how are people reacting? And I noticed the audience was there the entire time. And so that was just so refreshing to me, being in Oregon, right, seeing that in a non really Spanish speaking community to see audiences going places that I don't see audiences going in Houston, Texas, you know. Okay. So bravo, Ashland. <laughs> well, I, I just had an experience about the Spanish in a, I just did a play at the Goodman Theater uh, called Destiny of Desire. But <coughs> in the play, you have a, we have one, I probably put this song in Spanish in this play, totally in Spanish, a Mexican ranchera. And it, the place has quotes, but the first time we did it at the arena, as soon as the say began, I, mean, I would sit in the middle of the audience to take notes, somebody behind me was saying, they know we don't understand Spanish. Why are not that singing in English? I don't understand what's happening. Yeah, so I was, but so the quote following the song that Karen Zacarias put in there very smartly says, Mexico is the largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. The United States is the second. <laughs> So it was really cool because yeah. it's true, you know? So it was, it, it, it's a very important thing. But I mean, we usually do our plays bilingual, mostly in English, but you know, we have a lot of chicanismos in our play. <laughs> and and, 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 it, and it's, it's, it's Los Angeles. So somehow Los Angeles, I think, has, you know, they kind of, kind of get it. Or if it doesn't, they don't question it. But going out of LA was surprised, like going to Washington DC. Mm -hmm. It's like whole other animal. This you know what I mean? Like they they really, you know, even to Chicago. I mean, one person uh, who worked at the Goodman told me, I will never imagine a whole song in Spanish being sang in a stage. Wow. It's so emotional, <laughs> you know, and you think, wow, wow, that's amazing, <laughs> you know, to think that they will never think that at the Goodman Theater, because as the Goodman, somebody will sing a whole song in Spanish in the middle of that stage. So it's, it's, it's different in the East Coast, or in the, you know, that it is in, in this part of the world mm -hmm. for some reason. Hi. Um, I'm really new to this world of theater, uh, and I feel like I'm even new newer to the world of Latino theater, uh, Latinx theater. 
And I want to know, since I'm starting to gather, that there's this long history of it really becoming prominent and becoming a, a world, a market, and an industry where people like you guys can make entire careers out of. Uh, when you started seeing that, or if you didn't see that, and what you did to make that apparent for yourselves. When did you sort of start seeing that kind of media become prominent? When did you sort of start seeing it becoming something you noticed in this country? This year. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's the first time in the history of Latino theater we had three main stage plays in the United States running at the same time was Mojada OSF, was Sutsu at the Taper, and it was Destiny at the Goodman. This has never happened before. It's the first time in the history, which I think is really important. There was a comment that was a little bit of pushback for not vetting the playwrights in the 50 playwrights. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, imagine it was 50 feminist playwrights and it was curated by a white man. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering, and for any of you to respond to that, it just, it strikes me as odd. Um, I'll, I'll respond to that. Okay. I'm happy for anybody who defends our culture. I don't care what they look like. Art is art, and thank you to those who have put energy into bringing Latino theater here. Most of the people who are doing that are not Latino. You know, helping they're helping out uh, these incredible Latino artists, so I'm grateful to anybody. Uh, all the editors of my books have been uh, white men or uh, white women, and they have helped me find my voice as a Latino writer. So I'm, I'm grateful to uh, Trevor for his work. Thank you. I would, um, that's a great question. I think, um, so a personal kind of <coughs> core philosophy for me is really speaking with the community. So it's really important for me to, anytime I'm writing about something, to be interviewing, to be talking with those people, uh, the playwright, the director, the actors. Um, so in my, my book I'm working on, I do a lot of ethno ethnography, um, but also I find a lot of energy I get from working with the Latinx theater comments, coming to these types of things and meeting the actual community, right? So I'm always speaking with, not for. Hi, um, I'm an indigenous playwright and uh, there's been a, a great push within indigenous uh, theater to decolonize the, uh, the format, so to speak, to get to the essence of what the culture is. And I want to ask you, as you know, playwrights of color, as writers of color, what's, what is that essence that you're trying to reach within your own culture, trying to pass that on to within your work? Well, I guess I, I, I can start to answer that. One of the things that I was interested in exploring in my work, which um, I think is something that resonates with the Latinx community in Canada, which is mostly uh, a community of political refugees who have suffered extreme political violence, um, was how to explore that violence on stage without it being uh, shocking or gratuitous or, um, how do you say that, titillating. Um, I, I don't have the answer. I'm still trying to find the answer. So I try to explore that in my play, The Refugee Hotel, which is getting its reading here tomorrow, and also in my play, The Trigger, is how do you explore uh, torture, rape, uh, violence on stage? Um, and, you know, I identify also as a feminist, right? Um, how do I do that, right, without uh, reinforcing stereotypes, without um, re-victimizing our communities? And, um, you know, in, in the refugee hotel, like the most uh, violent scene is just a person speaking about what was done to them in a concentration camp. But it took me, it, you know, it's, uh, it's um, 
ironic how the most, the simplest scene is the one that almost always takes so long to write, right? It took me like two years to get to the point of, oh, that's the answer, right? Of just having the actual person who it was done to just stand there and speak the fucking words, you know, as opposed to showing anything or having somebody else talk about it, right? And having the person speak the words to a complete stranger, right? Because these are words that he will never speak to those closest to him, right? Which is the reality certainly in the Chilean exile community and in the Guatemalan exile community in Vancouver, et cetera, et cetera, is that most often the families don't know the stories because it's too painful to share them, right? So we just did the refugee hotel in Vancouver and the Latinx community came out to see it in full force. Ironically, that was an almost all white production because it was at a theater school where, uh, where we used the students that were handed to us and they did an incredible job, right? And they really did uh, do a lot of research. I like what you just said, uh, know what you write, right? They did a ton of research and, and, and approached the work with uh, huge respect. But the Latinx community came out in full force to see it, and not just the Latinx community, also the indigenous community. Um, and uh, the thing that they felt, um, one of the things that they felt uh, strongest about was that I didn't shy away from the violence in the play, and that, there, and that it was treated with respect. Um, so anyway, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but one of the things that I'm interested in, in exploring in the essence of the work that I do is the part that's the hardest to talk about, the part that our communities uh, have yet to heal and um, um, you know, are still traumatized from and have not talked about yet. Yeah. And, and, and <laughs> that's, that's the thing that I wanted to say about that. Uh, one was, if you remember, I say when I get to this country, I figure out that I was Mexican and I needed to work and what that meant. So I love beautiful things. And, and I think we are beautiful people. And as part of trying to find a way to change the image of who we are to the world and to ourselves, you know, it's really important for me. That's part of the, part of the job. You know, we dignity is not something that is easy to show, but it's so important that we, I can be a farm worker, mm -hmm. but I have a lot of dignity. And how do I show, you, you know what I mean? Being poor doesn't mean you're not on, an honorable man mm -hmm. or an honorable human being. You're just economically in disadvantage. So that's part of what I have to do. So I, I love beautiful things. Mm -hmm. And also, I would say, I always tell my students, Sylvia is one of my students, that, you know, in, in English, there's this great word called a gift. Uh, ta a gift. If you're talented, mm -hmm. if you're talented, you say you're gifted. Mm -hmm. That means you have a gift. But gifts are to be given, then not for yourself. Mm -hmm. So when you think of the world that you're going to create in that way, you deal with less issues of this kind. Because you understand that this is a gift that you're going to give to the people that you're going to expose your work to. You know? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think um, it's beautiful. <laughs> and and just to riff off of that, I, I think that my own ambition, and I know this is you know, unreachable for me personally, but it's what I'm trying to do, is that I am trying to do the kind of work that you describe, but I want it to change the way this country understands itself. You know? My ambition is to write a novel that I'm working on now that changes the way Americans think about their history. So that they realize that so-called Latin American history, United States history, are really the same thing; mm -hmm. that they're intertwined, and um, and that's a really I think you know I think that we can change our work um, that we you know we do these battles to win these spaces within mainstream or you know uh, American culture. Um, those battles change the country. Um, and I believe that's really subversive, and we bring the best of ourselves, our understanding of what beauty is, and we change this country. That's what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 Um, other questions? 
I think I saw it. Was there a hand in the front? It was okay. answered. It was oh, okay, great. Mm -hmm. I saw it. I saw it. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes. First of all, I want to say thank you to all the Latinx artists in here that have paved the path to make it easier for young artists like ourselves sitting here. Um, my question for you for is, um, it's, it's difficult, you, even with the path that you laid that I can't imagine how it was when you didn't have that. How, how do you deal? <laughs> how do you deal? How do you, how do you handle it? How do you st stay tough and strong and keep fighting the fight? Um, you know, I think that you could realize you can only do one thing at a time. So for me, I'm working on one sentence or one paragraph at a time. And that's my battle every day. I need to win the sentence. Today I won the sentence this morning. Yay, hurrah! You know? And you work on a book. Now I know from experience that books take three, four years. That's a thousand days, a thousand wins of a thousand sentences. Ta-da! It's a book, you know? Um, and so, you know, I think that uh, also the most important school, I think for me, and I think maybe for most, a lot of us, is failure and allowing yourself to fail and not being afraid, you know? Failure has taught me so much. The one novel I wrote that I spent two, th I spent three years on it didn't sell taught me more than all the other novels put together, you know? But I think that just, you know, uh, re belief in craft, respect of the craft, you know, you're surrounded here by people who've spent decades, you know, hundreds of years, you know, <laughs> together, not just you. I mean, if you add all of them up together, collectively, 50, no, I'm just kidding, a century here. So, you know, you add up all that, that's a lot of work, you know, and, uh, and, and studying the craft and trying to sort of respect it and learn from it. And just one battle at a time, I tell my writing students, they're 19, 20 years old, just finish something, you know? <laughs> finish something and go to the next one, you know? That's my own advice. I would say what he said, and also, um, don't, don't try to get people to like you. Mm. Yeah, like, like I also teach, uh, I mean I direct and I teach, and um, when I teach, I mean one of the first things I say to my students is, I don't give a shit if you like me. I'm here to teach you, and you can hate me or like me, I don't care, right? And in, in the Canadian theater uh, landscape, um, where I'm considered a very controversial person, I just, <laughs> I just always remember who my friends are. Colleagues does not equal friends. Right, and I can work very well with my colleagues and have very, you know, great experiences with them. But it, when it comes right down to it, who are my actual friends? And mo most of them are not in the theater community and are not artists at all. Um, so it, it, it's also about don't worry about who likes you and um, don't take anything personally. That's that has helped me. And. Um, I, I know what I value the most, which is I'm a single, I'm a sole parent of a 10 year old boy. That is the most important thing to me, right? As opposed to my career or anything like that. He is the most important thing to me. So a lot of it is just life experience. And um, I guess it has to do with failure, right? Not everybody's going to like you. And that's okay. Yeah. I, I don't believe that it's difficulty. In my world, they say, you want an actor to come play and hire him. Okay? You want an actor <laughs> what? To come play, hire him oh. or her. <laughs> no. I mean, no. I always think, that's what I'm saying, think about, look at, look at where we are. We're in this beautiful town with this beautiful day, all sitting down over here, talking about theater. We're so blessed. We're so privileged mm -hmm. to have, think about people mm -hmm. in the other side of the world mm -hmm. that are fleeing their homes. Mm -hmm. Think about people who's been deported today. Mm -hmm. That's difficult. Mm -hmm. We don't have it hard. We have it easy. Yeah. And, 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 but sometimes we don't think about that, you know? So that's why for me it's never difficult. Uh, come on, look at <laughs> how lucky I am. Well, how blessed I am, how privileged I am, 
You, you know what I mean? So, it, because I hear my like I I don't let my students tell me that. I don't care. I I if I'm gonna have a class with you, you're gonna be prepared. You're gonna do your work. I'm doing my job. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you, whatever you, you have to do your work. Mm -hmm. And you have to do it at a great level. You can't come in here and say, no, I'm sorry, you know, I have to go home because I didn't have a car. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 I mean, it's a lot of complaining going on out of nothing when, you, when you're in a major university. Mm -hmm. And you have a dorm and you have food to eat. That's, that's, not, that's not that. And also in the theater, I hear people, oh, it's so hard. No, it's not that hard. <laughs> it's really not. Come on, we play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not that hard. So that's the, what we have to get out of it is the idea that we have to complain about things. <laughs> We're privileged. Come on, we are. Yeah. So that's my thing about. So if you think about how privileged you are, even if you have ten cents in the in, in your pocket, it's ten cents. There are people who don't have ten cents mm -hmm. in their pocket. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the way we get out of this. And the word that that's what we do. What is so beautiful? What we do? Just think about. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I would just. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was just going to add what, uh, to what Carmen was saying, build community and find your community. That might be in person, it could be digital, right, S with social media. Some of my closest people I go to first are people I've never met or I've met one time mm -hmm. uh, at something like this, and we're buddies on Twitter, and I, you know, I saw the, a picture of the, I walked by the scene, or no, the costume shop, and I s took a picture and sent it to one of my costumer friends who I've met one time. Mm -hmm. Like, I've talked to in person for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. right? But it's someone that I go to, we trust each other, we message on Twitter. So find your community in whatever way, you know, it needs to be, right? Mm -hmm. To best, uh, you know, and it also might not even be a theater community. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. We have time for one more question, so we'll take this one right over here. I want to thank you all for all the work that you've done for the community, um, for the Latinx community. And I'm just wondering what, where do you, like, what's your utopia? Where do you want to see it? What is, what is the bar for success? Or does that even exist or just present, future? I, that's the best closeout question we could have asked for, right? <laughs> Were you planted as, you know, an audience plant? I think, um, <laughs> I'm going to steal this from um, Black and Brown Theater uh, in Detroit, which is Sam White and Emilio Rodriguez. But their mission of their theater company is to not exist, to not have to exist. Yeah. And so I would love, um, I mean, I'd love to keep doing what I'm doing, but I'd love to not feel like I have to do it, right? Where I can open it up to a, bi a bigger thing, right? Um, but at the moment, I feel like I, it still um, needs to exist the way it does to serve the community. So my utopia is a world where you go to ex Lord A Theater, and they're doing all of these diverse, inclusive works, um, just like OSF is doing, right? Where OSF's model is being replicated all over the country, all over you know, the continent. Um, that's kind of my utopia. Yeah, I agree. Um, mine is that sometime like 20, 30 years in the future, I'll be looking at some magazine, I don't know, like the New York or New York Times, or some future thing that exists, and people will be talking about the barrio renaissance, <laughs> you know, of the, of the first two decades of the 21st century, you know, and they'll be comparing it to the Harlem Renaissance and how there was this flowering of theater and literature that was finally recognized yeah. by mainstream culture. And, you know, and I just, I really, I, my fantasy is that we're all sort of part of this and that we get a little bit more, you know, sort of recognition back from the larger culture that we get now just because it would be more comfortable, you know. Uh, but I think um, that's what I foresee. I, I want to be part of, of, of passing on what I've been taught and see what flowers from it, you know, what, what grows from what I've been taught and can share with others. It's kind of a utopia for myself or for Los Dos. Los dos. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, I'm going to retire very soon, I think. Um, but retire uh, means I'm trying to figure out how I buy this 
part of an island in Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, honestly, <laughs> honestly, and and really create an artist compound. Oh. And I know, I know the island, and I know, and there's nothing by fishermen, so I can do invite friends to come and create, mm -hmm. and I can create theater with the people in that village only. Don't have to charge for tickets or think about fundraising or grants or asking people for money. You know, it's so complicated. That's a utopia for me that, that we can create and create with the community. And, and we don't have to worry about any of these other things that we all have to think about every day in the middle of the, this, you know. But that's really my utopia, and I'm gonna make it happen. I actually, I actually go in to do the bung bungalows and invite people to come. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. And oh no, I I can't think of anything to add to that. But that's amazing. Thank you. Yes. Same. Same. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, um, Hector, Jose Luis, Carmen, and Trevor, thank you so much for the work that you do, the people that you are, and for sharing your full selves with us today for this conversation. So very grateful. Um, and thank you all for being part of it and looking forward to seeing more of you this weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes.